When my mother's cancer returned a couple of years ago, and it became clear that her days were numbered, our family noticed that there was a change in her personality. Uh, we saw that she was more open, transparent, and candid, more easily able to express what was on her heart. Uh, she was also more easily able to say no. She became more decisive about saying no to things she did not want to do. And even though her appetite was generally down, she savored her favorite foods and really enjoyed them. My mom's experience was not unusual. According to psychiatrist Irvin Yalom, who conducted a study of terminally ill cancer patients, quote, an open confrontation with death allows many patients to move into a mode of existence that is richer than the one they experienced prior to their illness. According to Yalom, his patients were able to recognize as trivial the things in their life that were trivial. Like my mom, they were more open with their family and loved ones. They were able to more decisively say no to things that they didn't want to do. And according to Yalom, these patients were also more present. In the fall, they could really enjoy the changing colors of the leaves. In the winter, they could really savor the dancing snow in the air. And they were more present to the person who was right in front of them. Many of these patients said over and over again, why did we have to wait until our bodies were riddled with cancer to learn how to value and appreciate life? But we don't need to wait until we are facing some serious illness or some tragedy has befallen us or a loved one before we live in a way that truly values what is most important. When we live by intentional rhythms for life, which as Craig has mentioned, is going to be the focus of this new sermon series in January, or by what the monks describe as a, quote, rule of life, we can live in ways that honor the things that are most important in life. If you've been around 10th for a while, you know that from time to time we talk about this concept, this practice of a rule of life. If you're hearing this phrase for the first time, don't let the word rule itself scare you because the way the monks use the word rule is different from the way that you and not use the word rule. When monks use the word rule, they are referring to one of the ancient original root meanings of the word rule, which simply means trellis. If you go to a vineyard, you'll see that a grapevine is supported by a trellis, keeping it off the ground, freer from diseases and predators. The trellis also allows the grapevine to experience more sunlight, to be pruned and guided in its growth so that it produces better grapes and therefore better wine. And a rule of life is something that acts in our life like a trellis. It's a rhythm of life that supports our life with God so that we receive more of God's sunlight in our life, so to speak, so that our lives can be pruned and guided by God so that we produce more of the fruit of God's love, joy, and peace in our lives. January is a good time of the year, as Craig has mentioned, to create a rule of life, or to tweak a series of rhythms for life that we have. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks about how we can cultivate a rule of life that will help us find joy in God and in each of the dimensions of our life. Dallas Willard, the late wise writer in the spiritual life, said, Organize your life so that you are experiencing maximum contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And when Dallas says, organize your life so that you're really experiencing joy in God, contentment, he is 
describing what it's like to live by a rule of life. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, says, when you analyze happiness, it turns out the way you spend time is extremely important. Now, this is probably intuitive to a lot of us, that happiness is linked to how we spend our time. And a rule of life helps us find joy in God and in the different parts of our life in a very practical way by guiding the way we use our time. So if a person lives by a rule of life, they will likely have a particular time at night when they aim to go to sleep. And they'll likely aim for a particular number of hours of sleep. And this helps them live with a greater sense of well-being, with a mood that would uh, be more elevated than, than otherwise. People who are married or have children and live by a rule of life set aside a certain amount of time in the day or, or, or the week to be with their spouse or children. Single people who live by an intentional rule will initiate on a certain timetable, weekly, monthly, uh, connections with people. As you might imagine, people who live by a rule of life will, will tend to have a certain time of the day or, or, or week where they direct their conscious attention to God through prayer or through scripture. Some people, not everyone, but some people, as part of their rhythm of life, include exercise. And they'll, they'll have an idea as to how they'll exercise and uh, at what time frequencies, what time of the day or, or week they'll engage in their workout. Many people who live by a rule of life also have a Sabbath practice, which we'll be talking about more in just a moment. If you've been around 10th for a while, you may also know that I've written a book on crafting a rule of life called God in My Everything, How an Ancient Rhythm Helps Busy People Enjoy God. And in the back of the book, there are examples of various people and their rules of life, including my own. There's an example of someone who's a student, someone who's single, someone who's married. We've got a rule of life for someone who is a parent and someone who is an empty nester. If you don't have a copy of the book, there are copies available in the Upper East Hall afterwards at a book table. All proceeds go to missions and organizations that work with vulnerable children like World Vision. And if you're watching online, you can also pick up a copy, of course, online through Amazon or your favorite online retailer. Inspired by Michelle's rule of life in the back, and I think she used something like an Excel spreadsheet. She likes organized boxes. I've created a rule of life worksheet that includes some potential practices like prayer and silence, scripture and reading for growth, care for the body, relationships, Sabbath and play, and so forth. And the time frequency with which you might consider engaging in these practices, whether daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly, and so forth. And you can pick up a copy at the book table if you want as well. And if you're online or if you prefer to download it from your computer, you can go to 10th.ca forward slash rule of life. 10th.ca forward slash rule of life. But today I want us to explore what a Sabbath rhythm might look like. Sabbath is ideally a day that is set aside for rest and renewal, where we find joy in God, in life, and in the most important people in our world. I love how Abraham Joshua Heschel, the renowned Jewish theologian, describes Sabbath as a, quote, palace in time, as a space to luxuriate in time and to enjoy God, life, and people. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we read these words. God speaks to Moses, and these are one of the Ten Commandments he gives to us through Moses. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor your foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. 
Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. May God speak to us through this, his inspired word. In verse 13, we read that in six days, God says, we are to labor and do all our work. So most of us will have a rule of life that will include work, whether it's paid work or voluntary work or studies. And we'll look at that more in a few weeks. But we're also called, we're in fact commanded to observe the Sabbath day, setting it aside for God. And according to the text, part of the reason why the people of Israel, also known as the Hebrew people, were invited to take the Sabbath was to remind them that they were no longer slaves living under the iron-fisted rule of Pharaoh, but they were free people living under the iron, not the iron, the, the, the loving, the loving rule of God. So let me get these words right here. I see some people standing. There's some seats right in the front if you prefer to sit, um, but you're welcome to stand as well. Sabbath is a reminder that our core identity isn't derived from our production or our performance, but from the simple yet glorious fact that you are a beloved son of God, that you are a beloved daughter of God. That's part of the gift of Sabbath. Joshua Heschel, as I mentioned, wrote a book on the Sabbath. And he describes Sabbath not as a way to recover from six days of work or as a way to refuel for a coming week of work, but he describes Sabbath as not for the sake of the weekdays. He says the weekdays are for the sake of the Sabbath. It is not an interlude, but the climax of living. Heschel describes Sabbath as a palace in time. Sabbath for us can be a palace in time where we delight in God, where we delight in life itself, and where we delight in people. And so let's look at these. Sabbath can be a palace in time to slow down and delight in God. Henry David Thoreau said that life is too short to be in a hurry. Isn't that good? Life is too short to be in a hurry. And Sabbath invites us to slow down and to really enjoy God. And part of our rhythm, as Craig alluded to earlier in the service, may be for us to engage, commit to a weekly practice of worshiping God in community as you are doing. Some of you are doing this online, but one of the advantages of worshiping God in community, in addition to it honoring God, is that it can foster a certain healing in our lives. Bessel van der Kolk has written a fabulous book called The Body Keeps the Score. And he points out that the research shows that one of the most powerful practices of fostering healing in our own lives, and this is especially true if we've been through some kind of trauma, is to sing in person, in groups, and that's what we do. We sing to our God. It glorifies God. It also brings us a greater wellness. Have you noticed that when people age, as they age, they become a certain kind of person? Mary Pfeiffer, in her beautiful book, On Our Elders, called Another Country, points out that people typically become, as they age, who they are. So have you noticed that some people, as they age, uh, they become more cranky? <laughs> you, you don't shout out any names, okay, at this point. Yeah. Uh, they become uh, you know, more rigid and bitter. And have you noticed that other people, when they age, become more open-hearted, more mellow, more loving, more at home in their skin, more at home with other people? I don't know about you, but as I age, I want to become a person who is more open-hearted and, and, and loving. And we can cooperate in that process with God by cultivating 
practices where we give thanks to God. Remember in December, we had a couple of big dumps of snow. You know, when we get, say, more than a foot of fresh snow, it can be hard to, to walk outside. But if we walk a particular path over and over again in the snow, it becomes easier to walk down that path. And so it is with joy. When we walk down a path of joy, we create a neurological and spiritual pathway that makes it easier to access joy as we give thanks to God. And so part of our rhythm of life can include giving thanks to God through worship or looking back over our week and giving thanks to God for the gifts or even back over our lifetime and giving thanks to God for the things that he has given us. Eugene Peterson, the great pastor and the translator of one of the versions of the Bible called The Message was once asked, what is the difference between a Sabbath and just a day off? And Peterson replied with jarring language. He said, a day off is a bastard Sabbath. What makes a Sabbath a Sabbath is that we set the day aside for God and enjoy God. Hopefully we have another day or other parts of our week where we can run all of our errands. But part of what makes a Sabbath a Sabbath is that we enjoy God. It is a palace in time where we delight in God. The Sabbath is also a palace in time where we can delight in life itself. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, even though he experienced blowback as a result, criticism from the religious leaders. And the reason Jesus healed people on the Sabbath was because he wanted to show people that it was God's intention to bring life to people, wholeness to people on the Sabbath day. My friend Mark Buchanan has written a book called The Rest of God. And he says in that book, the golden rule of Sabbath is to cease from what is necessary and to embrace what gives life. What gives you life? I enjoy, as some of you know, uh, running through the forested trails of the endowment lands not far from UBC. After the big dump of snow, I took our golden retriever, Sasha, through those paths that were whitened. It was beautiful. I like walking on the beach. Some of you love to listen to gorgeous music or to play music. Uh, some of you love to view gorgeous art or to, to paint or to see an uplifting film or to read an inspiring book. Some of you love to eat your favorite foods and that makes you come alive or spend time with someone special. Think about what makes you come alive and see if you can embrace that gift on your Sabbath day. As I've shared with some of you, um, some years ago, my wife Sakiko took a spiritual formation course out of Oregon and she had a classmate named AJ who discovered that Jewish fathers had a practice of giving their children some honey on the morning of the Sabbath. And the idea was simple, to teach their children that the Sabbath is sweet. When AJ learned this, on his Sabbath mornings, he would get up and with his son Elliot, who was eight or nine at the time, um, would make pancakes. And then they would just drench those pancakes in a lot of good old Canadian maple syrup. They would go and wake up AJ's wife, Elliot's mother, Quinn, and they would devour these maple syrup drenched pancakes. They would enjoy them. AJ says, when Elliot is grown up, when he is an adult, and I am long gone and dead, whenever someone whispers the word Sabbath, I hope he starts drooling. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I have some honey here from the honey shop. Anyone in the mood for some honey right now? <laughs> Anyone? Any takers? Don't be shy. Okay, I see a hand over here. Do you mind passing this back? <laughs> Great, there you go. Yeah, you bet, Huber. Great, enjoy. All right, this is a sweet day for you. Your daughter is being baptized as well, right? <laughs> Michaela, it's a very good day. That's something to, to give thanks for. A palace in time to delight in God. A palace in time to delight in life is part of what Sabbath is. And Sabbath is also 
a palace in time to delight in people. I tend to be a workaholic by nature. If it wasn't for the Sabbath commandment, I would probably skip the Sabbath, be working almost all the time. And so I'm thankful for the Sabbath because it has protected my family relationships, my relationships with my spouse, son, extended family, and friends. Sometimes on the Sabbath, I'll make a phone call to someone who <laughs> lives at some distance away, and, and that's, I think, a good use of technology. I tend to be screen-free on the Sabbath unless I'm using that screen uh, intentionally. Even if you're not a workaholic by nature, if you embrace the Sabbath, you can connect with your friends, your family, without feeling guilty that you're not productively working. And you can know the joy of that connection. Uh, Daniel Kahneman says that it is only a slight exaggeration to say that happiness is the experience of spending time with people we love and who love us. Dan Bruner, a friend and, and, and professor of ours here at 10th, uh, says that there are Sabbath friends and people who are not Sabbath friends. Spend time with Sabbath friends on the Sabbath. If you are single, it's going to take some initiative, some work, but it's certainly worth it. Some people, you know, Craig mentioned the marriage course earlier, assume that married people are happier than single people, but the data doesn't bear that out. Daniel Kahneman points out, this Nobel Prize winning economist, that the research shows that married people and single people are, generally speaking, equally happy. Married people report being alone less often and making love more often, both of which are good things, but they also report doing more housework, <laughs> which they don't enjoy, and less time with their friends. Someone appreciated that over here. Um, and so it, it evens out. But if you're single, you're going to need to take more initiative to connect with people who bring you joy and to whom you bring joy, but it, it is certainly worth it. Jeff Hawker is one of my colleagues. He is the associate pastor of our evening service here at 10th. He's also our minister of spiritual formation, married to Debbie Hawker, who's also on our staff as our minister of local outreach. They've got a couple of young kids, India and Maria, ages six and four. They practice Sabbath intentionally, so I want you to see part of their Sabbath day. Our Sabbath practices have evolved a little bit over the years, especially as we've brought kids into it. Now I will take the kids into the exercise room and they'll jump on a trampoline or just kind of roll around as I'm reading a book on the exercise bike and, and Debbie will make a lovely breakfast for us. So, sometimes I'll, the kids will uh, chop some apples with me and put in the ingredients for this recipe. We have a finished apple pancake and then we'll, we'll all come together and we'll light a candle. We will sing the doxology together while holding hands. And, um, and then we'll, we'll feast on this breakfast. And, and partway through, we'll pull out a notebook and everybody gets to share something of what they would like to do that day. Uh, yeah. Typically, after breakfast, we'll start uh, an outdoor adventure of some kind. So we, we love going to the beach or to the forest just somewhere where we're in God's creation and, and just get to see the beauty and be in awe at what God has made. Uh, we might bake something in the afternoon, uh, chocolate babka or <laughs> yeah. some bread. Yeah, something to, again, signal spaciousness. So whether it's a slow meal that day, that's, you know, stew of some kind, or as you said, bread, something that um, reminds us or signals to us that oh, there's time here. I can get cozy here. I, <laughs> I don't need to be in a rush. There's not other things that I need to do. In addition to like our time together, we, we want to have some solitude as well. The kids will have a quiet time uh, for an hour or two, each in their own room. 
Debbie often takes a nap. <laughs> yeah. I'm usually found at the, the piano with some headphones on. Uh, we just, yeah, enjoy a little bit of solitude before coming back together for a, a big family dinner. Uh, I feel like there's a, a domino effect when, when Sabbath isn't actually Sabbath, uh, when, I, when I treat it like any other day. And, and that really, I'm, the rest, the following week, I'm just depleted and not able to do all my responsibilities in, in the same kind of engaged way. Yeah, and I think too with our with our work, um, like Jeff works on Sunday night, I work on Monday night. Family time is limited, and so we need to be intentional about that. But you know, in, in seasons where things are fuller, um, we really feel um, tired physically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Probably get tired of each other, <laughs> and they get tired of the mess. You know, we are a real life family with real life struggles, and so sometimes we might write out a couple things that we think we're going to do. And then there's, it just goes a, a different direction. Yeah, we use this language of keeping the Sabbath and uh, realizing it, it feels more like the Sabbath is keeping me. <laughs> it keeps me sane. It keeps me uh, enlivened in all the various relationships that I'm a part of. And uh, yeah, I'm just so, so grateful for the Sabbath. And there's like a real sense of intentionality too, eh? Because I feel like, oh, I'm gonna have a day off, but rest feels different. Doing truly restorative activities like going for a walk in Pacific Spirit Park, or um, just sitting at one of our many beaches here and just looking in awe at the mountains across the ocean there. It's, it's a practice that, uh, like I said, reprioritizes my, my desires, my affections, and what I think is significant in the world. I can just fall into get it done mode rather than rest and delight mode. And uh, I'm learning that that's not good for the family and it's not good for me either. I really need this. It is so good for me and for all of us when we really do embrace the Sabbath. Yeah, Sabbath has been an absolute lifeline for, for our family culture. Sabbath has been a lifeline for the hawkers. It can be a lifeline for us as well. Most of us won't own a second home. If we're residing in Vancouver, a lot of us will never own a first home, especially with interest rates, you know, going up. But, but if we embrace the gift of Sabbath, we can own a second home in time that is truly luxurious. In fact, we can have a palace in time as we delight in God, as we delight in life and in people. Let's pray together. Sabbath, as a friend says, is the gift that we cannot afford to refuse. And so is God inviting you to embrace Sabbath? Whether you're a student, whether you're working, whether you're in some other kind of role, to delight in God, in life, in others. That you might know joy, a deeper joy in God and in your life. If so, talk to God about it for a moment. And if you would like to do so, commit in your heart to embracing the rhythm of Sabbath. And as you do so, may you know God's peace and his joy in fuller measure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.